So my talk is, what a strange long trip it was. And this, of course, is a quote from the Grateful Dead, a music group. Uh, but it's interesting that in Portuguese, that it and T-I are kind of swapped. So I made it what a strange long trip T-I was and probably will be. Who is Mad Dog? I've been in the computer field for over 50 years. I've had a wide variety of different jobs. I've worked for very large and very small companies. I've been a wide variety of different things, including a university educator, and I've actually taught operating system design and database design and compiler design in that time. But most of what I'm proud of is I am pragmatic. And even though I don't spit on people if they use closed source software, I try and encourage them to use free software and open source. So I'm going to be going very fast to this talk. I may not read every bullet. I may not even talk about every bullet because I only have an hour to do it. So I will explain that from the beginning. And speaking of the beginning, if you go way back into the beginning, there wasn't really any such thing as computer science. We, it's more like computer black magic. We had no networking unless you were carrying a box of cards down the hall. We had no security unless you locked the door to the computer room. We had no graphics, or, well, maybe ASCII art, but trust me, Tux was not available at that time in ASCII art or any other way. And we didn't have systems administrators. Uh, at the most, we had operators, people who would start a job up, rip the printouts up, mount the tapes and things like that. So again, this was computer black magic because people never really bought computers back in those days. They were simply too expensive. And if the companies had a computer in their company, it was because they typically leased them from a company called like IBM or Control Data Corporation or any of the other large companies. There were no computers in a person's home or, or even their high school. And the first time that people actually touched a computer, students actually touched a keyboard, would be coming into a university class. Um, the software was actually owned by the customer. You bought the software. Now, you know, and you usually got the source code with it because it was too expensive to create a binary distribution for one type of computer. And there were many, many different types of computers. There was also no copyright or patent protection that was applied to software. I mean, you could get copyright on books or movies or things like that, but they hadn't brought that to the computer yet. And so most software was protected through contract law. If I wanted to buy a piece of software, I contacted the company. I said, okay, this, you know, I'm going to buy your one compiler, $100,000, and I'm going to buy that. And you might negotiate for several months with your lawyers and their lawyers as to buying that particular piece of software. Now, this picture, by the way, is the first computer I ever programmed, an IBM 1130. I punched cards. It was, it was programmed in Fortran, and it ran one program at a time. There were also not what we would consider to be professional programmers. There were people that they, they didn't make their living writing programs. They were mathematicians or physicists or engineers, and they wrote the programs to solve their problems. And oftentimes they would say, well, you know, what am I going to do with this now that I've written it? And they would give it away to user groups or put it up on bulletin boards, often in source code form, so that people could help them make it better. And I belonged to one of these organizations that was called DICAS, the Digital Equipment Corporation User Society. And I would get all sorts of software for this, my little second computer that was a PDP-8 with an ASR33 teletype as its input-output device. That computer had 4,000 12-bit words in its memory. That was all you had. And so a lot of times you programmed it in assembly language. Often there was no operating system that came with the computer. When you wrote your program, you compiled it, you 
linked in all the device drivers directly into your program and then you would boot your program and that would run inside the computer and a lot of computers had switches and lights on them to show you the registers and the memory that you were having because there was no interactive debunking with them you would set the values you want to deposit in memory in the switches and you would deposit that then you would set the address you would increment the address and so it was a kind of very very primitive by today's standards methods of writing and debugging programs if you did have an operating system it tended to be tuned to specific hardware it was on and it was also tuned to the application that it was running so you had uh, you had operating systems that were tuned to be batch types of operating systems or time sharing types of operating systems or real time types of operating systems because the CPU was so slow and the memory was so small that it had to be very, very efficient. You had operating systems for medical purposes and operating systems for scientific purposes and so forth and so on. And this kind of debunks the theory that operating systems were made different because computer companies were trying to lock their customers into their products. I never, ever was in a meeting where that was discussed. It was all about how can we make this operating system more efficient for the customer because they're buying a very expensive piece of hardware and they want to get all of the efficiency out of it. But about the 1960s, late 1960s, the hardware costs started to drop. And the, the margins on each system went down, but the volume numbers of systems went up. And out of this came the concept of the personal computer, one of which was the uh, MITS Altair 80, 8008 or the IMSI 8080, eventually there were systems that ran this little operating system called CPM. And PC stores started to grow up where they specialized in selling PCs. And just like you had stores that specialized in renting uh, tapes for your TV and, and later on CDs for music and things like that, these stores came up because the market demanded them. And what was happening at this time was that the hardware becoming cheaper and cheaper. It's what we call in accounting an expense item. It's not an asset. When you buy an asset, you have to buy it, you have to keep track of it, you have to depreciate it day after day, year after year. It's very difficult, but when it's an expense item, you don't have to track it. You simply buy it, you show the receipt, and that's good enough for tax purposes. So. The whole marketplace of computing was changing as these computers became cheaper and cheaper and the margins on each unit became smaller and smaller. Um, this included in 1969 two people from Bell Laboratories who decided they were going to write their own operating system just for fun. This wasn't a, this was a research project. It wasn't anything that they thought was going to be commercial. They didn't see a big marketplace for it. In fact, Ken Thompson, the person who started the project, actually wanted it so he could play Space Wars. And it was Space Wars was on a hard copy terminal. It wasn't, didn't use graphics or anything. It's a hard copy terminal. You typed in some numbers and it typed some things back to you. And you typed in some more numbers. And that was great fun for Ken. And he joined with a friend named Dennis Ritchie, who the two of them started to design what they thought would be a great operating system, and eventually they called it Unix. Now, even back in those days, Unix was not open or free. It was a resource project, as a research project by these two men, and they worked for the telephone company. But Ken often taught computer science. He taught operating system design. So one time he took this tape of his, of his little operating system, when he went on sabbatical to the University of California, Berkeley. And he showed it to the students and he used it so that the students could uh, learn how an operating system worked. 
and the students kept making it better and better. Eventually, Ken went back to Bell Laboratories, but the students continued. And this eventually became the Berkeley software distribution of a Unix-like operating system, which we call BSD. So, but it still was closed because there was some AT&T code in it. It was covered by copyright by this time. And, you know, people were supposed to be able to use that unless they got a license from AT&T. And this was very, very expensive. It was $160,000 per CPU. And, you know, if you had a second CPU, it was another $160,000. And so a lot of people didn't buy that, but universities, particularly research universities, got a site-wide license for the whole campus for $350. And so Unix began to spread, and it was also used by the military and other things, and it started to get there. But a lot of the software of that time, instead of being open, instead of being shared freely, started to become closed and distributed only in binary format. And it was owned by the company that created it, or the developers that created it, not the end user. And, and what this meant was that when you wanted to start a development project, you spent your first couple months talking with lawyers and managers and things like that. So large companies did sell systems. And this is an IBM mainframe. I programmed on that also. Um, but they sold hardware, software, and support as a package, or they rented it as a package. And they started to develop what we call channels in the industry, where the company, the OEM, might sell to a distributor, and the distributor sells to a reseller, or they sell to a consultant. These are called a channel, and it flows the hardware and software out. This was uh, being created about this time. And then other large companies with contracts would put together stacks of software. And some of these companies are very famous, Oracle and SAP and PeopleSoft. They create huge pieces of software that are extremely expensive for running your enterprise. And many of you in the audience have actually either worked for a company like that or had to buy their software and had to work with it, particularly if you're my age. But with all of that, a few years ago, I began to realize that people really do not buy or even rent hardware, unless it's very, very low margin hardware, like a single board computer, or software. They don't buy software either, particularly in Brazil, where you pirate about 84% of your desktop software. Of course, if you're a company, or you're the government, or you're an educational institution, you have to buy the licenses, because if you're found pirating software, you can get in a lot of legal trouble. But the average person, the average uh, store owner, things like that, they may be using pirated software, and only 16% of your software is actually paid for. However, even with that 16%, Brazil still sends millions and billions of reais every year outside of Brazil to the United States, to Western Europe, to China, wherever they, the software comes from, in purchasing software that they really could produce inside of Brazil and give jobs to people inside of Brazil. So what do people really buy? This is, the, this is the key to the problem. What they buy is a solution to a problem. That's what they're buying. They would, maybe they want to play a game. Well, I mean, you could play a game by having two tin cans tied together by a string. I mean, that might be good enough, but we found that, hey, computers are really good at doing that. Networking is really good at doing that. So people start to do that. And even if you have a more sophisticated game, you know, it's still computers are really good at doing that. So if you can think about it this way and make your project or product actually the service of providing a game or the service of providing banking or the service of, then the customer really doesn't care you know, what software you use 
as long as their problem is solved. And so the game has now changed. And now computers do not cost millions of dollars a piece. You can get a Raspberry Pi in the United States for $35. We hope to reduce the cost of the Raspberry Pi in Brazil uh, dramatically soon. And you can do web-based development. You don't even have to have a computer other than an access to the internet to do your development. There's lots of development facilities online. Software can be collaborative from the beginning. You don't have to work by yourself. You can have people helping you, you know, in a, in a goal of having this software to solve their problem. You don't have to buy millions of dollars of advertising in magazines anymore. And you don't have to buy, put big billboards because a lot of the marketing these days can be completely social through things like Facebook or YouTube or other things. Very, very low cost or even free. The financing even is more crowded. You know, crowdsourcing is, is a normal way of financing, particularly a particular product or project that you're going to be doing. But when you do that, having a prototype is key to doing that crowdsourcing. Because if you can show the people in the crowdsourcing that you have a working prototype and this is what they're buying and, and it's, it's actually working, but you need to tune it up a little bit, you need to make it light, a little nicer looking, you need to go into production, then crowdsourcing is a lot easier and the time of the crowdsourcing project is a lot shorter. Also, people are starting to look at different ways of having companies. I mean, traditionally in capitalism, you have a chief executive officer at the top who's been hired by a board of directors who report to the stockholders. And these are the people that get all the profits of the company. And then you have the people that are doing the working, you know, creating the product, the engineers or the, the people in manufacturing and stuff. They're paid a salary. And no matter how hard they work or how much they produce, you know, they still get the same salary. And the people in the in the board, the owner and things like that, they get the profits. And there's a lot of things that are wrong with this type of a model. And so the concept of a employee owned cooperative where the employees are actually the owners and they hire the managers and they hire the CEO and they pay them a salary for what they're doing. This is becoming more and more useful and more and more looked at by more and more people. So there are employee owned cooperatives where the employees are the owners. And there's also customer owned cooperatives where the customers are the owners. And these are used typically in things like uh, power, power plants producing electricity for your house or other things. You know, in Brazil, you have a typo that is a government owned cooperative in effect because it's paid, it's supported by taxes, it's supported by the amount of electricity that people buy. But they are supposed to be producing this as a service to their customers. So why should you use free and open source hardware and software and culture? Because you can look at Creative Commons in the use of photography and, the, and text and music and things as a branch of free and open source software. Well, one thing you, it does is it reduces the cost of development. Back when I started programming, you wrote the whole program. If you needed to sort something, you, you wrote the sort program. If you needed to search something, you wrote the search program. And now, if you wanted to sort something, you just use sort. Many, many sort programs and sort algorithms are supplied with the operating system or are available over the internet. This allows you to reuse this software that is already being used by millions of people. It's already been debugged. You don't have to debug your own code anymore. And this allows you to bring the product to market faster. And that too reduces your cost because the longer it takes you to bring the product to market, 
the more it costs it fixed costs to produce that product into the marketplace. It also allows you to tailor the solution to the customer's needs. Now, does the customer speak your language? Well, with open source, you can use strings to allow to have different languages being used to things. But it's, it's also, does the customer have different needs in your culture? Does the customer have needs of accessibility? Are they blind? Are they, you know, hard of hearing? Are they, do they only have one arm? These are all types of things that if you're open source, you could actually change the product to meet your needs or your customer's needs. Um, I have a whole drawer of different electronic devices, which I could no longer use because the company that made them has gone out of business. I can't get updates to the operating system anymore. I can't get updates to the devices anymore. And as an, with an open source project and a community of people that are using it, I could go get together with that community and say, oh, the company's gone out of business. I, you know, why don't we get together and support this software until the hardware is completely gone or so few people using it that nobody really cares. And for the people to say to me, this is why I buy my software from large companies like Microsoft. I say to them, large companies like Kodak, large companies like Enron, large companies like Digital Equipment Corporation, Compaq Computer Systems. And even though Compaq bought DEC and Hewlett Packard bought Compaq, so in effect, these companies are still in existence, a lot of times product lines are dropped. So, for example, Microsoft XP. Microsoft said, oh, you know, we've, we've lost interest in XP and there's nobody using it, so we're going to make you go to Windows 7 or Windows 10 or Windows something. However, there were still hundreds of thousands of people using XP and many people using XP in embedded systems. And so you need to be able to have a product or a solution that lasts as long as you want it to last. And finally, people say, well, Bad Dog, if I create all of this stuff as completely open, as completely free, how am I going to make money? Well, this is your secret sauce. This is the thing that you add to the solution to make it so that people buy it. And if your base product is completely free and completely open, you will find that ported to many, 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 many different systems. And people start, many people might start to use it, whether they would pay for it or not. And you can track these people and you can make a market out of that group of people to add your little secret sauce, your service or your product, which you're putting on top of it. So let's take a look at some real problems that need real solutions. Uh, there's a thing called a point of sale terminal. If you've ever been to a Bob's or you've ever been to a small supermarket, you go up to the register. We used to call them cash registers. Now they're point of sale terminals. And you have a scanner and you have a scale and you have a cash drawer and you have a printer for your receipts. These are all part of a point of sale terminal and there's millions and millions and millions of them. But they're also really expensive and we'll get to that in a moment. That's the front end. That's the part that you actually make the sale at. But typically behind that is something known as an enterprise resource planning system. And this is software that allows you to maintain your inventory. It's software that does your accounting for you. And as you expand it out, it may do your manufacturing control. It can do your customer relationship management work and things like that. This is very sophisticated software that helps the business be more efficient with whatever they're doing. Now, there are 
commercially available closed source systems. Uh, one of them is produced by NEC. It is not extensible by the user. I mean, maybe they have partners who can extend it or change it, make it you know, more of what you need. But the, the end user can't do that. The customer can't do that. And it's pretty expensive. I mean, you may be paying like 20,000 US dollars for one terminal and a very small and inefficient ERP system. Oracle is another uh, you know, seller of this. They actually bought a company called Micros that made point of sale systems and ERP systems. And it is not extendable by the end user. It is also very expensive. No, it's actually very expensive. It's actually very, very expensive. And you may pay 5,000 US dollars just for the software. None of the hardware is included in that, just one copy of the software. That's how expensive it is. On the other hand, there's something called Udo. It is an open source backplane of software. You can plug in modules to it. There's a lot of modules that are completely open and completely free. And this can be enough to allow a small company to get started at a very, very low cost. There are also closed modules, which are free. And these modules are made by people that want to sell services and things to the Udo community. There's also closed source modules that are not free, that you have to pay money for them. But they usually use some special type of thing or do some special type of thing that it's worth it to people to buy them. There is a community association of people using Udo that contribute their time and talent and, and everything. And across the world, there's 1,568 support companies that make their business out of supporting Udo. There were 81 in the United States, and there were 13 of these companies in Brazil. So here are people making money off of free software. Some, some of their secret sauce is closed, but mostly it's free. And you can write additional modules that you need and plug them into this backplane. But the other side of it is how available this software is. It'll run on Windows, and it'll run on GNU Linux. It'll run on Debian-based systems and Red Hat-based systems, or RPM-based systems. It'll run on Intel, and it'll run on ARM. So you could use, for example, a Raspberry Pi to run your POS system. And here's an example of a POS system that was built for about 700 US dollars to buy all the parts, brand new, take it off the internet, purchase one at a time. They weren't purchased in quantity. They weren't using used parts or anything like that. But we put together a point of sale system doing this. Here are the different types of things that they cost and they had and the different costs of them putting it together. If you tally all this up, it comes to 700 US dollars. So you can get a complete point of sale and ERP system that's open, that's extendable by you, and you may need multiple point of sale systems for a small store. Let's say you have three cashiers, you have three registers, so you need three of those, but that would tie into one ERP system for each store. And so the whole thing could be maybe uh, four or $5,000 instead of 70 or $100,000 going with a closed source system. Here's the example. This is uh, Aeneas uh, Filo of Kami. It's one of the companies in Brazil that supports Udo. He was at, with me at Latino Wear a couple of years ago showing this, and this was running off of a Caninos Lucus Labrador computer instead of a Raspberry Pi. But you can see the small printer there and the display screen, and this is set up that, you know, it's Udo in action. There were lots of books on Udo, 
And to learn about Udu, you actually have to take two sides to it. You have to learn how do you use an ERP system to run your business. You can do that with just your laptop computer or your desktop computer. You can install Udu onto that. You can practice setting up databases. You can practice setting up, uh, you know, pretending you're a business of some type and learn how to use this ERP system of Udu to run the business. The second part is actually creating the point of sale terminal. And there you'd actually have to buy the hardware, set it up so that you could learn how to set up a point of sale terminal for some specific business. So that's Udu, point of sale and ERP system. Here's another example, something called Freedom Box. It's a free software server that uses open hardware that allows you to keep your most precious treasured information at home behind your firewall. There's no binary blobs in the entire system. It's easy to set up and maintain. There's a dashboard at the front that helps you set up things like your web services and things like that. And it can be made from a single board computer like a Raspberry Pi. However, the project also sells hardware off of their website. Uh, all of the software for making Freedom Box is included in Debian 10. And, you know, and this project was started by Eben Moglen, a professor and law professor at Columbia University in New York City. Eben is a person who wrote the GPL version 3 license. He's a big freedom fan. He likes, uh, he, he likes security and privacy. I mean, why would you, why would you want this instead of just putting your information up on Google or Amazon or something like that? Well, we know that there's this agency in the United States called the NSA, and they just love looking through your data. And when you're a U.S. citizen, you may be somewhat protected by things like what we call our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. But you, as a Brazilian, have no rights at all. And in fact, if I talk with you, that could be enough to allow my government to spy on me because I'm talking to somebody who is not a U.S. citizen. So this, this little server would be the, play, the place to put your most private of information. You know, things like pictures of your cats and, you know, maybe your credit card numbers and things like that. And, you know, the birthday of your mistress or whatever. Oop, sorry, I went too fast. Back. Oh, yeah, there we go. So this is some of the functionality that comes in Freedom Box or is in Debian 11 as part of the Freedom Box package. And you can see it allows you to set up all sorts of things like chat servers, and you can set up your own simple GitHub type of mechanism. You can have uh, you know, Samba to store your, your you know, all of your different operating systems data in one place across, across your internal network. So there's a lot of functionality here, and you can go to their site and learn more about it. Now, this is also, in the future, probably going to be the basis for a lot of federated social media. You may have heard of Diaspora, or you may have heard of GNU Social or some of these. Well, the, they're in the process now of making these interact with Freedom Box even more, so we can have a federated social media site to give much more privacy. So that's Freedom Box. You could, you could sell Freedom Box to various people. You could help them install it because even though it's a lot easier to install than uh, most people would do if they were doing it from Debian or Red Hat, it's still not easy enough for your mother and father or for your grandmother or grandfather. So you could actually make a business of setting it up showing them how to use it and making sure it's maintained and things like that, that could be a business you could get into. Here's another business. It's the Cody Multimedia Center. Uh, most of you are familiar with Cody. Um, it is a thing to store videos or view videos, 
you can store music on it you can uh all sorts of software it has a very nice interface that you can uh, use this on your tv or on your uh, lcd panel and at a couple of years ago i set this up and was showing this at cbit in europe i got an inexpensive pair of speakers this is just uh, stereo speakers, didn't even have a, a subwoofer on it, that I think I got for 30 US dollars, and I used an LCD screen, keyboard and mouse, and I was showing movies there at the, uh, at the show. But you could extend it a lot more. So for example, you could get a, heart, uh, a power amplifier that has maybe 100 watts going out of 16 different channels and you can plug this into your HDMI port on your SBC and allow the digital music software to separate out the music and put it through all these different channels. If you wanted to hear really great music, you could do it this way. You might notice on the front of the panel at the top that there's no switches there's just a bunch of lights. Well, that's because your computer is doing everything that all those switches and stuff used to do. It's your computer that controls the volume. It's your computer that controls, controls the mixing. It's your computer that does all that stuff. And at the very last moment, it is fed into the power amplifier, which then converts it into an analog signal, which goes out to your speakers. So, this, you can set up a wonderful home audio system this way. You could use an LCD projector, which are getting pretty cheap these days, to be able to project the TV image onto the wall. Instead of paying four or $5,000 for an 84-inch unit, you could project that onto the wall for a couple hundred. Or you could drop a screen down and project it from the back if you wanted to. You could NFS out. NFS mounts your phone and show your videos and play your music and stuff from your phone directly through your audio system amplified. You could use this system for people that do not have any connection to the internet. You could use a single board computer to give them their first connection to the internet as well as a wonderful multimedia system. You could also, on the same system, put your IoT software to give them home automation control. And all of this is included in Debian. You could do it and also other major releases. What's often not discussed about this whole thing is that if you're living in a city, there is also over the air TV. And you can pick up these TV signals, Brazilian has a standard for that, and you can pick up these TV signals and play them through your Prodi system without having to pay any fees for that. You can pick up a lot of public uh, types of systems, public uh, TV systems and things like that. And there are actually channels for other types of, of data and information that you can pick up through this. You can set up a simple burglar alarm through a webcam if you live in an apartment, you could point your webcam at the door. And when you leave, you arm it. And if anybody breaks into your apartment, it would snap a picture of them. And you could then have that on your phone. Douglas Conrad, a friend of mine who runs a company called Opens, created one of these systems. And he, he put a lot of work into it to, to get it all set up properly. People would come over to his house for parties and barbecues. And he would say, oh, would you like to see some of the pictures from my latest trip? And he would pick up his phone and controlling his Cody system from his phone, start showing pictures that were still on his phone. He had not loaded them onto the Cody system. He was showing the pictures. He would play them music. He would have this projected TV. And after a while, his friends would say, where can I buy one of these? And Douglas would say, well, this isn't really a product. It's just a project I'm doing. You know, they said, no, no, you misunderstand me. I want to buy one. How much do I have to pay? 
And so you could put together a product or a service for high end or even low end, you know, audio, you know, and sell that as one of the things you sell. There are hundreds of thousands of FOSS programs and projects out there that with a little imagination could actually be the basis of your business. You could start to sell these. You could start to, you know, to sell the hardware and the software together as a solution. You could make money off of doing this. And there's dozens of cheap single board computers that run Linux that you could make as the basis of this. And you can make dozens of solutions, not only for you, like Douglas did, but for your customers. But in all of this, you have to create your business plan. You have to know, how am I going to make money? How much is it going to cost to produce this? What is the fixed cost of my business versus the variable cost for every unit that I sell? Can I make enough money? Can I pay people to be my salespeople? And once you start to create that business plan, then you can see how a free and open source software and hardware system can actually make you money. So with that, I'm going to stop and give people a chance to ask questions. I know there's a lot of stuff to, to come. And uh, I'll just uh, stop my screen from being shared, and we'll go from there somewhere. Stop presenting. There we go.